so we the, our products address different aspects in the connected business to guide you through the digital transformation. So we have offices around the world. So I'm based in uh, the US Mountain New office. We have another office in New York and another one in uh, London. And our the main R&D center is in Sri Lanka. And overall, we have about uh, 500 employees with about uh, uh, 350 engineers. Uh, and our main customer base is mostly from US and EU. The digital transformation is uh, not just about technology. It's about how you could benefit from the technology advancement to innovate in your own business domain. It has to be driven by vision, not by the technology itself. The committed leadership is the key to be successful in digital transformation. It is a lever that turns the technology into transformation. In almost all the success cases, the transformation was steered by the top-down leadership by setting the direction, uh, building the momentum, and ensuring that the company follows through. The top-down leadership also means strong governance and coordination. People in uh, different departments, units, often do their own thing, but the true advantage uh, for the business comes from linking these different digital activities or initiatives. For example, uh, Nike built Nike Digital Sports in 2010 to provide coordination, innovation, and, and some sort of shared resources for companies' main digital efforts. Then again, Starbucks, so they created the position of uh, Chief Digital Officer in 2012 for the same reason. The, the, the digital transformation focuses on making the business different through technology, not on the technology itself. So if you look at uh, this nice book called Living uh, Digital. So that looks into uh, how executives have transformed the way their companies operate and present. And, and they, they come up with three different uh, ways to lead the digital transformation. So one way is customer experience, operational uh, processes, and then the innovative business model. So in the rest of this presentation, I'll be uh, using this model to highlight the role of IAM in the era of digital transformation. According to Gartner, the identity and access management is, the, is a secure discipline that enables the right individuals to access the right resources at the right time for the right reason. So IAM or the identity access management addresses mission critical need to ensure appropriate access to resources across increasingly heterogeneous technological environments and to meet increasingly rigorous compliance requirements. This security practice is a crucial undertaking for any enterprise. It is increasingly business aligned and it requires business skills, not just the, the technical expertise. So there are multiple components in IAM system. So you may already know about this stuff. Provisioning, uh, or you can call it as Onboarding, account management, identity governance, identification and authentication, access control, then identity federation. So IAM is a broad area, so the above components can be further divided. For example, uh, provisioning talks about inbound, outbound provisioning, just-in-time provisioning, and uh, approval workflows. Then accounts management talks about uh, privileged accounts management, relational management, users, groups, roles management, then uh, we have identity governance, which talks about role engineering, identity analytics, declaration of duties, uh, role consideration, identity delegation, attestation, so many other components. Then authentication talks about multi-factor authentication, uh, adaptive risk-based authentication, which is quite popular uh, in this time. Access control talks about access control based on attributes, roles, and policies. Then the identity federation talks about single sign-on, single lookout, session management, attribute sharing. So this is this is never a complete list, and it will keep on growing. Most often, people struggle to understand the gaps and potential security vulnerabilities related to identity and access management tasks. To address these challenges, first the developer model called first the identity management maturity model. With this model one can identify the gaps in the current IAM environment, evaluate the maturity, and incorporate those findings into 
secret strategy. So this defines six material levels. The first one is no next system. Basically, no anti management system in place and and basically do not realize the need. For example, the HR department or the human resource department possibly may get a spreadsheet to manage all the employee information and their salary. So that is the case I know. Uh, uh, one employee hacked into an HR department computer and downloaded the complete spreadsheet with all the employee information with salary details. These kind of environments do not require users to log in. Having just logged into the wireless network over the, the corporate network, as assumes users can access any application. The second one is, or the level one, is add uh, Under this, not all the applications require users to log in and access. Uh, on case by case basis, users can manually provision into applications and the user records are distributed across multiple applications. The, the single user may be in different applications with different usernames and uh, this may be possible due to uh, the constraints in, uh, uh, constraint in the username introduced by each application. Then the level two, repeatable. Many organizations are at this level. So most of the, the organizations that we have worked with, so they are at the, the repeatable level. Uh, an employee uh, on his uh, uh, or her first day has to meet the IT guy and get their email set up or the other applications provision. So IT admin knows exactly what needs to be done and whenever an employee resigns, uh, the IT admin knows how to manually deprovision the user from all the connected applications. Still, the user records are duplicated across multiple applications and uh, users may have different credentials for different applications. Having an IAM system not designed from the beginning with a page that was to be at the optimized level some point in the future could cause severe headaches in the future, future during migration. Recently, I worked with a large analytics firm in USA to help them migrate from their current IAM system, which is uh, quite ad hoc in nature, into an op optimized model. The key challenge there was to come up with a model to build a unified IMD model across all the applications. <coughs> they had more than 30 IMD stores used by multiple applications and the same user is duplicated in each IMD store with, with uh, no uh, correlation handle. The level 3 is defined. So this is a better improved version of level 2. The entire IMD management process is documented and possibly maintained in a checklist. When an employee joins the company, the HR department sends an email to the IT department and IT department creates all the access uh, uh, required for that particular employee by his or her role. Still, the user may be provisioned to multiple applications manually. Sometime back, I worked with a large uh, financial organization in USA. So they had about 70 plus departments and each department maintains its own set of applications with custom access control rules. These rules are maintained in different custom formats and given a user what level of access the user has in the company is something really hard or uh, it's not really impossible to figure out. Then the level 4 measure. So level 4 measure level removes a lot of manual involvement from level 3. Once the user record is created in the HR application, the user will be automatically provisioned to all the connected apps with appropriate level of access rights. The, the user will be deemed provisioned automatically when he she resigns. Then the last one, the level five. So this is the ultimate wisdom expanded on level, the level four measure level. I think governance plays a key role here. There, are, there will be multiple dashboards based on the organizational roles to monitor what's going on. For example, how many external users signed up by month and out of all uh, signed up users, how many are actively using the system. At the same time, if your organization hosts multiple applications, then you may need to know uh, user access patterns based on uh, the, the service provider or the application for a given period. So understanding the current state of the IT management system is an enterprise, in an, any enterprise is a key to make it aligned with the future business goals towards the digital transformation. So let's talk about customer experience. 
transforming the customer experience at is 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 at the heart of digital transformation. Digital technologies are changing the game of customer interactions with new rules and possibilities that were unimaginable only a few years ago. Customer IT and access management or CIAM is a whole emerging uh, new area in IAM, which is essentially an uh, ingredient for digital customer experience. Today's increasingly sophisticated uh, customers now uh, view digital interactions as the primary mechanism for interacting with brands and consequent, uh, consequently expect deeper online relationships delivered simply and effectively. So, so what else? These customers still expect some control around how firms collect, store, manage, and share their profile data. With the competition only a click away, your firm misuse of customer data, whether, whether deliberate or inadvertent, can significantly damage brand equity. For example, Yahoo. So Yahoo was in uh, the middle of a series of data breaches during the last couple of years that exposed the personal information of more than 1 billion users and uh, already has cost the company uh, more than $50 million. Yahoo had to lower uh, the sales price of its email and other digital services to Verizon communications from uh, around uh, 4.83 billion to uh, 4.48 billion to account for uh, potential backslash uh, from uh, these data features. So, customer-focused IAM systems are different from its traditional IAM counterpart. So, we'll be talking about onboarding, uh, social logging, then. Uh, then the challenge uh, we all face security versus uh, convenience, then the role of capture, scalability, and compliance. If CIAM or customer identity access management processes are, are cumbersome, uh, bulky, customers will go to your competition where these processes are more streamlined and easier to use. The same is not true for employees. Very few employees leave their employer because business to business or, uh, or business to employee, B2B or B2B, IAM process are hard to use. In, in uh, B2B IAM, the employee is responsible for creating users, identity and accounts. But in the customer space, the customer generally creates his or her identity, which means that firms can spend more time validating and verifying the identity instead of creating the identity. In other words, for employees, it's the, uh, it's the HR department who initiates the employee onboarding process and remains the owner of the user accounts, while for customers, in most of the cases, the onboarding happens via self-registration. It can be completely new, fresh customer, or it can be an existing customer, uh, but now works use companies online services. So let me give you a few examples. Sometime back, I worked with a popular life insurance provider in the USA. Uh, the insurance, insurance agent, so they sell the insurance policies and then to do the payments and claims online, the customer has to uh, register via the company's website. The customer registration uh, form on a minimal set of details like the policy number, uh, social security number, name, uh, maybe date of birth. And the user provided information at that point will be automatically validated against the user record or recorded in the system at the point uh, the agent uh, uh, sold the, the policy. And another company I work with who sells medical equipment to individuals and medical institutes, let, let their customers register via a company website to consume online services. As in the case of the previous example, the medical equipment are sold by sales agents and all the customer data are recorded in Salesforce. When a customer decides to register online, the data entered by the customer is verified against the data all recorded in Salesforce. So these are some of the patterns we see during the customer onboarding process. In addition to those examples, there are multiple companies that I uh, we work uh, with uh, who open up the user registration for fresh customers. Most of these companies 
let customer registration via a known public ID provider or a social ID. And this vastly reduces the initial barrier for registration. And there are multiple uh, case studies which confirm the huge success rate in uh, user registration after integrating with known public ID providers like Facebook, Google, or Microsoft Live. Social login. Integrating um, social IDPs for self-registration does not necessarily mean uh, one should use the same identity provider for login. This goes hand in hand with business operation uh, user performs after the login. If, if it is an uh, online bookseller, you will probably let users login with their public identity provider account. You will further maintain user interaction patterns, uh, uh, wish list again that particular user record. But uh, but at the point user wants to buy something and share his or her credit card details, you may need to force the user to create a set of local credentials. So that's mostly for secure reason. Any transaction must be confirmed with this local credentials they are not. One company I worked with recently enabled users to log in with their social identity provider of choice. But locally enforced multi factor authentication via SMS. Overall, for any serious business, just relying on social uh, login brings convenience, but then again raises a larger security concern. So we need to find the right middle path based on the business goals. Security versus convenience is a long lasting debate. Finding the right balance is extremely hard. One guy I met from Google from Secret Team mentioned they are working on for months by gathering user feedback for just changing the colors and to find the right alignment of the text on the Chrome page displayed to the user when it finds the public certificate of website is in that. So that's that's the level of effort people put. I have involved in many discussions where people discuss for hours how to design customer login pages with multiple identity provider options. One company uh, who is a manufacturer of a popular credit card payment processor in the USA let both the public users and employees log into the same set of applications. Both the uh, employees and public users share the same login page. But the employees login is from another connected identity provider, so in their case it was an uh, ADFS. And in other words, the, the immediate ID provider will federate to another ID provider for employee login while the public users can just type their credentials and login. The most obvious solution was on the login page of the immediate IDP, provide a link to login with the corporate ID. And then remember it on the browser for further login. So this is a very common pattern followed by many service providers who accept uh, multiple ID logins. But after a lengthy discussion, we agreed not to do that. But follow the identifier first login approach. So if you uh, log into Google or Yahoo, so they follow this uh, identifier first approach. And based on the type username, in, in, in this case, the email address, so decide whether it's a customer or an employee. And if an employee, feed rate to the corporate ID. Another way of Handling multiple ID provider login scenarios is by the home and discover. In this case, the IDP expects the service provider or the user to send some kind of a hint that will help to find the home ID provider corresponding to the user. So this will give seamless login experience for the user. Another good initiative by uh, GSMA is the GSMA Mobile Connect, which is which is a profile built on top of OpenID Connect. So mail this user experience, the, the user convenience. With Mobile Connect, users can log in to any uh, separate service provider just by authenticating with their own SIM. Here the mobile network operator or the MN node acts as the IT provider. If you are in US, you may not be familiar with Mobile Connect, but it's getting very popular in Asia, Pacific, and Europe. Uh, all the six key MN nodes in India to support Mobile Connect. And it's also uh, supported in China. And uh, in this summer, Mobile Connect will be launched in Canada as well. Unfortunately, still, there are only few service providers who accept Mobile Connect based on. 
So capture plays a key role in customer conversion rate. People hate spam at the same time they hate capture too. Over the time it's proven that even the hardest capture can be sold by state of art machine learning algorithms at a better uh, rate than humans. There are many companies who have shared the experience with capture and one common thing in all these uh, case studies is after introducing capture the customer conversion rate has previously gone down. With the new recapture from Google, a significant number of users can now access their human without having to solve the capture. Instead of, uh, uh, instead they can just uh, do a single click and confirm they are not a robot. With Google recapture, uh, it takes away most of the challenges enterprises face in custom onboarding and provides the right balance between convenience and security. Identity and access management has a direct impact on security of identity data and regulatory controls over the collection, storage, and usage of identity information. As the organization grows, more and more consumer identity data are collected to make more personalized context-based decisions. These can be personally identifiable information or just contextual information. Whatever it is, the organizations are bound to follow rules and regulations imposed by government and different industrial bodies. In, in USA, we have uh, the federal level legislation like SOC uh, and uh, GLBA in the financial sector, in, uh, in uh, PERPA in the education sector, and HIPAA uh, in healthcare. And the general data protection uh, regulation uh, GDPR in Europe. So it intends to strengthen the and unify data protection for individuals within the EU. It, it also addresses the export of personal data outside the EU. And uh, the, the, the primary objective of GDPR is to uh, give citizens back uh, the control of their personal data. And also to simplify the regulatory environment for international businesses by unifying the regula regulation within the EU. Then in Singapore, they have a Personal Data Protection Act, and then Australia, they have Privacy Act. So basically, the, the, your, the corporate identity access management system, as well as uh, the customer identity access management system, both need to be aware uh, with these regulations. The consumer uh, IAM system has a great need for scale than a B2B or business to employ IAM system. Although many firms have a, a successful enterprise-wide employee IAM deployment, that number is in tens or hundreds of thousands of active users. The user populations of leading online consumer properties are 10 to 50 times larger. This creates numerous architectural challenges as CIM solutions must be able to support login flows and personalization preference management for hundreds of thousands, even billions of online consumers. Most of the uh, identity access management projects that we have worked with are customer facing. The largest project in terms of number of users was done in Saudi Arabia. Uh, that's for more than 4 million users. So they deployed up this running server over a, a 4 million user base. And it's a common pattern that in most of the cases, the customer facing IAM projects do go up to uh, millions of users. While workforce IAM uh, projects, most of the time in thousands. So picking the right IAM store is a key decision in managing scalability. Most of the time, what I have seen is people go with databases for managing customers while using an active directory on an LDAP server to manage employees. One of the projects we did for a state government in the USA. So they use Active Brick to manage internal employees while use uh, uh, MS SQL database to manage it. In either way, you must not use the same identity store to manage both the employees and the customer. Then again, capacity planning is an exercise one would carry out before any serious deployment of the customer IAM infrastructure. You rarely get a second chance to convince a customer who has a bad first impression. The rule of thumb is, if 
totally fine to over provision resources but never under provision. One popular example from the history is Friendster. Friendster was a popular social networking site uh, before Facebook, but it failed to scale with the demand and totally uh, totally went down with the increased increased demand. And today it's a popular example to show how businesses fail not being able to address the demand and scale. Not every enterprise focused on digital transformation worry about customer experience. They look inward. The, the workforce I am look inward. It focuses on B2E, uh, business to employee, and B2B, business to business interactions. The goal of workforce I am is to reduce the risk and cost associated with onboarding and offboarding new employees, partners, and suppliers while while the, the purpose of consumer IAM or customer IAM is to help uh, drive revenue growth by leveraging IG data to acquire and retain customers. The key challenge in workforce IAM is to create IMD silos in the enterprise and build a unified IMD platform, which will result in much improved productivity, security, governance, uh, business oversight, compliance, and monitoring. Ultimately, this will reduce uh, both the risk and cost associated with B2E and B2B interactions. If you look at the history, most enterprises go to their acquisition, mergers and partnerships. In USA only, mergers and acquisitions volume totaled to 865.1 billion in the first nine months of 2013, according to uh, Deloge. So that is a 39% increase over the same period a year ago and the highest nine months total since 2008. What does this mean to workforce I am? You would have to work with multiple heterogeneous IT stores, IT federation protocols, legacy systems, and many more. Bring your own identity or BYOID is the key to facilitate B2B business to business interaction. BYOID is not just about uh, uh, bridging social identity with enterprise identity. It is also about bridging different heterogeneous identities between different corporate enterprises. Samuel, uh, Open ID, Open ID Connect, W Federation, all support ID Federation scenarios and cross-domain authentication. But can we always accept, expect all the parties in the Federation use case to support Samuel, Open ID, or Open ID Connect? Most of the federation systems we today see today are in silos. It can be a silo of Summer Federation, a silo of OpenID Connect, WS Federation, or OpenID. You are not able to talk between these silos. So this is not just between enterprises, even within one enterprise. So there can be multiple departments going through this federation silo. Recently I had a call with a large company in the finance department finance domain and they mentioned that they have more than 10,000 service providers or applications internally using multiple IT federation protocols. So we need to find a way to get rid of these federation silos and build a way to facilitate communication between different heterogeneous protocols. In addition to federation silos, another anti-pattern we see in large-scale federation deployment is the standard identity. You create many point-to-point Trust relationships between multiple IT providers and service providers. Even in a given federation silo, how uh, how do you scale uh, how do you scale with the increasing number of service providers and IT providers? It's really hard. Each service provider has to trust each IT provider, and this leads into the stability, identity, and the pattern. With identity bus pattern, a given service provider is not just coupled to a given IDP and also not coupled to a given federation protocol. A user uh, should be able to log in into, service, uh, log in into a service provider which accepts a uh, summer to or token, only summer to or token, with an IDP who only issues open and connect token. So that's the, the beauty of the IDP bus. And IDP bus will, uh, IDP bus will uh, act as a middleman who mediates and transforms IDP tokens between the heterogeneous IDP protocol. Either knowingly or 
unknowingly, most of the enterprises uh, use the IIT bus patent address, they complete Wellsworth IAM. Bring your own uh, device, BYOD, itself brings a lot of challenges to <laughs> corporate IAM. In, in last in last February, uh, another employee who flew back into USA after spending a uh, uh, few weeks abroad in, in um, uh, South America was detained in by a US customer, US customs and uh, uh, border border uh, patrol, and and pressured to give uh, them the, the agents his phone and the access pin. It may have contained sensitive material that wasn't supposed to be shared, but the, the, the phone was returned to uh, the NASA employee after it was searched by uh, CDP, but he doesn't know exactly what information officials uh, might have taken from the device. So that's why the BYOD is quite important. With BYOD in place, employees tend to access the corporate network with their own personal devices and possibly store confidential data local in the device itself. The role of workforce I am with gets extended with BYOD and needs to be deeply integrated with mobile device management and EMM or enterprise mobility management solutions. The <coughs> MDM tools make sure that the corporate applications can be restricted to operate in controlled memory and, and uh, the managed storage lets the company restrict access to corporate data based on the geolocation of the device. Then the EMM goes further. With an EMM solution in place, the device becomes an integral part of the corporate IT environment. So, in other words, uh, the device must be enabled with the same control and be subjected to the same deployment management as any other device using the corporate resources. So, the careful design of the IAM strategy, implementation, and forward thinking is the key to success in the digital transformation. So now let's have a look how oh, the role of WS2 Iron Server in digital transformation. So WS2 Iron Server is an open source Iron Access Management Server released under Apache 2 or the most business friendly license. And it addresses critical IAM needs both in customer IAM and workforce IAM space. It's true open source and it's basically one of the, the leading true open source uh, IAM uh, uh, product in the market. It has extensive support for open standards, which include SAML, OpenID Connect, OL2O, WS Federation, SACMAL scheme, likewise. So we do support almost all the uh, undefined standards, and, and it can be deployed on-prem, so you can just download identity server as a zip file, or so we have cloud deployment too. Okay, let's look at how you do IDT Federation and SSO with WS2 Identity Server. Since Identity Server supports multiple heterogeneous protocols, Identity Server can be used to build a unified Identity Platform. You can, you can uh, uh, configure or uh, connect Conquer which supports SAML, then Office 365 which supports uh, WS Federation, and maybe an Android app which supports OpenID Connect or, uh, or uh, uh, a web app which supports OpenID Connect and then build unified single sign on experience. So that means if you log into your web app with SAML, you may be automatically logged into Salesforce, Google Labs, or Office 365, irrespective of the identity federation protocol that those applications do support. And this is the most strong uh, the feature in identity server. Identity server can be deployed over multiple heterogeneous identity stores. Uh, it can be a MySQL, MSSQL, Oracle, Postgres database, or it can be an LDAP, uh, even uh, uh, Windows Active Directory. So you can deploy it uh, with, uh, uh, across all these identity stores simultaneously at the same time. So this is a very useful use case if you want to bring in many legacy applications, many departments who manage uh, user identities in silos and then build a mapping between uh, uh, the same user in different user stores and build a unified identity management experience. Then identity server acts as an identity broker. So this is the key, key uh, critical component in custom IAM. 
and also in uh, in uh, uh, workforce area. Yeah. So you can use a Redis server to mediate and transform tokens between uh, Summer, OpenID Connect, WS Federation, CAS, and OpenID. Uh, and if you also want to add any support for your legacy protocols, it's it's uh, quite easy. Uh, the way we have built the product is quite extensible. If you want to uh, add support for legacy protocol, you just need to write that particular component. It can be an inbound authenticator or a federated authenticator. You just plug the system and it will just work with the other functionalities provided by the Adit server. Then multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication is a critical component in uh, Workforce IAM. You need to make sure your account so your employee accounts are uh, well secured. So we do support FIDO U2F. So FIDO is becoming the the, the de facto standard for multi-factor authentication. And also we do support uh, uh, TOTP, uh, SMS over OTP, uh, SM, uh, sorry, OTP over SMS, OTP over email, uh, then uh, uh, certificate-based authentication, RSS secure ID. Likewise, we do support 40 plus uh, uh, different uh, protocols. If you go to store.wc.com, you can find all the connectors we do support. And all the connectors also released under the same Apache 2 open source platform. Then we do support provisioning. So we do support the provisioning based on uh, a scheme, both inbound and outbound provisioning. And for outbound, we also support uh, proprietary connectors for Salesforce and Google Labs and also SPML. And also we do support just-in-time provisioning. So that means if you uh, want to log into Salesforce with Ping, another identity provider, then identity server in the middle will act as a broker which mediates this uh, the communication. And if you want to just-in-time provision the user from Ping to your own local user store, so that can be done. So this may be quite useful uh, uh, to onboard users from social IDP. So your application needs not to worry about that process. Just just talk to identity server with a standard protocol. The identity server will take the user to any of these social IDPs, and in the return path, it will provision the user to a, a given user store or the identity store. Approval workflows is another critical component in Workforce IAM. Whenever you onboard an employee, you need to make sure the user is provisioned to write the application with right roles after the approval. So I think the server do support uh, uh, multi-layer approvals. You can say uh, the first, uh, this request needs to be uh, get approved by user Tom or user Peter or anybody belong, uh, belongs to full role. And once that is done, it will move to the next layer and then there also you can do the same set of uh, configuration and ask people to approve. So once user is approved, then only user will get added to the uh, or provision to co corresponding applications with the corresponding uh, the roles. Self-service is a critical component in uh, customer IAM. So we do support self-registration, uh, password recovery, then uh, all the user self uh, user admin operations like update user profiles, uh, uh, password reset, and also another uh, key feature we do support is map account. So if you have a user who is in multiple user stores, uh, then that particular user can log into the user portal and map all these two, uh, all those all those uh, related accounts together. So this is a way of like building a unified uh, uh, unified IT experience and go to the op optimized uh, uh, IT management level uh, that we discussed before. Fine grain access control. So we do support uh, fine grain access control based on attributes and roles. So we internally using SACML. So SACML is the de facto standard for policy based access control and uh, <coughs> And with Identity Server 530, you can do fine grain access control for your uh, applications during the authentication flow itself. So that means you can say only the sales team will be able to log into Salesforce if they try to access it during, uh, let's say, 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. in a week. To so that level of uh, granularity, you can go with uh, uh, the access control policies. And with IS 530, we ship a set of uh, 
templates, so you don't need to understand SACMAS. If you just edit the templates, you can get it to work. Then uh, we do support uh, all the uh, prominent uh, uh, security standards for uh, API security, uh, mostly based on OO. Uh, so you can use Identity Server as an authorization server uh, for OO based security. Then analytics is a key component in identity governance. It is both important in uh, uh, custom identity access management as well as uh, workforce identity access management. With IS, you can uh, you can capture how many login success attempts, failed attempts by service provider and also by IDP. And also you can find out uh, uh, login attempts, success, failed login attempts by a user. And uh, also with IS 530, you can find out uh, the number of sessions in the system and also uh, uh, length of each session and also number of sessions by a given user. Also you can uh, you can set certain criteria like uh, to raise events. Let's say like you want to get an event or notified if user tries to access the system for five times and fail for five times but uh, got through the six times. So that this could be a anonymous behavior. So in that case you can configure the server to set an event. So we have very good analytics support and in the upcoming releases we'll add more support, more features uh, related to identity governance and analytics. Okay, so so during this uh, uh, webinar uh, we discussed uh, uh, the key components of uh, digital transformation and uh, how one would drive digital transformation and then again the role of identity access management in digital transformation and how you can achieve that with WS2 identity server to some extent like we didn't go through like whole set of features in identity server it's, it's very powerful product we only touched that product uh, uh, features in this webinar so uh, so maybe uh, we can share the links if you want to know uh, more about identity server so that concludes the webinar and if you have any questions uh, please uh, type that uh, in the go to meeting uh, chat window So there's a question asked uh, whether the presentation, the slides will be shared here. So this is recorded and uh, both the video and the uh, slides will be shared. And then again, I have written a detailed blog on this. Uh, if you go to uh, uh, medium.facilelogin.com, uh, then uh, you can find more details, uh, such as in the blog, explains everything with uh, the link. So, so most of the things are just comments, uh, their feedback on the talk, but I cannot see any questions. Uh, uh, so thank you all for your comments, uh, uh, but let's Let's spend a few more times uh, uh, if you have any questions. Okay. Uh, the, the question asking, does this identity or tool is on-prem or can uh, go with cloud? Yes. So <coughs> we have on-prem on version as well as cloud version. So if you go to uh, cloud.ws.com, uh, there you can uh, sign up uh, for WS2 Identity Cloud. Can I extend the security model to include uh, domain and uh, user group? Uh, so uh, to answer this question fully, I need more like uh, context information. So we have uh, we, we have a way of grouping users uh, in the product, and uh, and uh, there are multiple uh, implementations we have done. Like uh, if you if you talk about this uh, the the controlling access and then uh, and then ex uh, then giving the decision outside to our PGP. So yes, these things can be done. I think uh, I cannot give you an exact answer. Like uh, uh, maybe you can send us a mail to prabhat at wc.com. Then we can discuss in detail and uh, figure out what exactly you need. But uh, but 
<coughs> sorry. Uh, so we have many complex use cases around uh, this stuff. Uh, do you offer a FIDO server or is your product a client uh, for an existing FIDO server? So we do act as a FIDO server itself. You don't need to have any other uh, server. So we do support FIDO U2F. Uh, you can uh, you can register your own uh, FIDO device with us. Then use it to use it for uh, uh, use it to sign up for other applications. Like uh, so, there are many like uh, articles on like how you can. Uh, uh, secure access to uh, SaaS apps like Salesforce, Google Apps uh, through IS and enable FIDO based multi factor authentication. Any uh, any use case handled with banking and uh, life science with uh, this tool, uh, which you can share. Okay, so uh, so there are many use cases uh, both in the uh, uh, finance industry and other industries. Uh, Actually, I cannot uh, name them. Uh, uh, if you, we, we have done some talks at the WSO2 con too. Uh, if you can send us a mail uh, to prabhat at wso.com uh, or to bcdev at wso.com, uh, so we are happy to uh, share those details. As well, some some examples I highlighted. Uh, uh, in the talk itself without uh, the name, but we can uh, go into details uh, if you send a mail. Yeah, so I think uh, so we'll uh, close for now and if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to send us. Uh, so once again, my email is prabhat at wsu.com. Thank you very much for uh, joining in and we have uh, another set of interesting webinars in lineup. And uh, please uh, subscribe and sign up for those webinars and uh, looking forward to see you again. Thank you very much for joining.